Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to be here this morning. Uh, certainly, I don't want to be here because Craig has COVID, but uh, it's good to be here. Had COVID, yes, I'm sorry, had COVID. Uh, I will tell you, this is a, a great church. Uh, it's interesting that under COVID, there's not been a whole lot of positives that have come out, but there are some. One of the positive things is that most churches are putting their services online at different times. Now, I oversee 39 churches in Michigan and Ohio, and I try to get into every church every year. Well, 2020, I couldn't quite do that because of COVID and being in the various churches. But I was able to watch most of the services online. In fact, a lot of what I do on various Sundays is that I'll watch many services, and then on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, a lot of times my devotions are to watch somebody preach their sermon and to see what's going on in our churches. And one of the churches I always like to watch is Salina. Your pastor is an excellent preacher. He shares the word of God in such a way that I learn and I grow. And so I've listened to most of his services in Mark. It's kind of fun to, to listen to those. It's really good what you're all doing and where you're headed. Now this church also, the worship is tremendous. Wasn't that a great set today? I love the fact of what they sang and what they did. This was wonderful. I will tell you, my wife likes coming here too, and she's not with me today. And the reason she's not with me is because my 92-year-old mother in Maryland found out that she can actually get a COVID vaccine tomorrow morning. And so my wife is on her way to Maryland to help my mother be able to get up and be ready and be out at 7.30 tomorrow morning. She's got to be in a local uh, town to, to get her COVID shot, which is kind of exciting to know. Uh, I've been concerned about her as she uh, looks at... Uh, COVID. But it's interesting that, that Craig is preaching through the book of Mark. I love the book of Mark. Uh, one of the things that I've always done in my 40 plus years of pastoring is that whenever somebody's a new Christian, I tell them to go to the book of Mark first. The book of Mark is very simple in its message of who Jesus Christ is. It doesn't get into a lot of the abstracts that John does or some of the others. It doesn't really start with the story of Christmas. Uh, you can go to Luke and Matthew to do that. But the book of Mark starts, and actually it starts with ever Jesus being baptized by John. And the Holy Spirit comes down, it says, like in the form of a dove. And God the Father declares, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So it's all the Trinity, there it is, baptism. And then after that happens, the next things that happen, and you've heard about this over the past couple weeks, Jesus spends time doing two main things. He calls his disciples, and he, he heals and drives out demons. And that brings us a little bit to the scripture of this morning, which is found in Mark chapter 3, verses 13 to 37. And it's going to be up on your screen. If you have your Bibles and want to follow along, I encourage you to do that. Mark chapter 3, starting at verse 13, and going to verse 35. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to them he gave the name Bernerges, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he's out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebub. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end is come. 
In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without trying, first trying, tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They're guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. This passage begins by Jesus appointing the 12 disciples, and he names them. Now, Craig has talked about the call of the fishermen, he's talked about the call of Levi, but it's interesting as he gives these 12 disciples, they're an interesting bunch. They're 12 interesting characters. They have all kinds of different personalities, personal qualities. Some are introverts, some are extroverts. All 12 of them, if you read about them, are opinionated people. You look at two of them, James and John, and he calls them the sons of thunder. In fact, they wanted to call down thunder and lightning from heaven to get rid of all the Samaritans. One had a strong opinion about Nazareth and said nothing good could ever come out of Nazareth. Some were risk takers, some were very cautious. There was a diversity of political views. Think about the political views. Craig talked to you a little about Levi. Levi, or Matthew as he's called here in this list, was a tax collector. He was a government worker. You know, as you read the book of Matthew, you'll see that he talks a lot about Jesus and his authority and really a little bit of a, a, the governmental authority that Jesus had. So Mac, Matthew seemed to be a, a strong government person. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have Simon, Simon the Zealot. Now the Zealots were a radical bunch that actually were somewhat almost toward anarchy. So you've got both ends of the spectrum there. You've got 12 opinionated people that had all kinds of thoughts and ideas about life. And Jesus brings them together into a group. It's no wonder they couldn't get along with each other at different times. It's no wonder they argued and fought and Jesus had to often tell them, quit that, stop it. You know, when I look at their various ideas and thoughts, I think if we brought it down to today, I really do believe that some of the disciples would have been Republicans, some of them would have been Democrats, and some of them would have probably been Independents. It took Jesus three and a half years to bring them together. And they still made all kinds of mistakes, and there are different times Jesus had to stop them and say, quit it, just quit it. But by the end of three and a half years that they came together, they learned to love each other to respect each other, and to forgive each other. And they focused on what was important, the kingdom of God and its growth. And you know what we're told in Acts chapter 16? They changed the world. They turned the world upside down. They turned it around. These 12 people who were so different, who were so diverse, changed the world. You know, I want to tell you, in, in the midst of our situation in our country right now, and I don't need to go into a lot of detail, Craig's already talked a little bit about that, this gives me hope. We have a diverse group of people with all kinds of diverse political views. If we come together as the church, as we come together as, as people of God, and we as Christians learn to love and respect and to forgive each other and to forgive and respect and love others, we can change the United States and change the world. This certainly gives me hope. But this is kind of amazing that, that Mark lists them and talks about their differences. He calls Simon the Zealot. He talks about the sons of thunder and sort of gives them their name. 
They're so diverse. When you look at that and you say, and Jesus is calling them all together and he's going to make them into a band and he's going to be with them for three and a half years. Your first thought might be, is Jesus crazy? That actually brings us into the next part of the scripture because that's a little bit of what his family thought. The next part of the scripture says that his family said he is out of his mind. He's out of his mind for calling these 12 different people together with the diversity they had. He's out of his mind for making some of the decorations he has. Now, his family gets a lot of flack on this. Oh, excuse me for saying flack. I... It... <laughs> They get a lot of uh, criticism on this, but I don't think that criticism is, is justified. I think they were coming not because they were upset, well, they were a little bit upset with him, but I think they were coming to try to protect him. You see, already we found that the Pharisees, the leaders of the law, that people had come down from Jerusalem, they were watching him. We already find that the Pharisees and the Herodians had gotten together and said they were looking for a way to kill him. And those rumors probably had already started. And so they wanted to protect him. His family was coming to say, we need to take him away and protect him. We need to protect him from himself. What's interesting is they didn't, not all of them totally believed at this point. Later on, James and Jude came to have faith in him and they both write book, wrote books of the Bible. The book of James and the book of Jude are both written by Jesus' brothers. He's out of his mind. The very things that his family was worried about seemed to happen right after that. You see, as Jesus was teaching, and there were large crowds that were coming, and as he was teaching, he couldn't even eat. There were so many people there. And it says in the scripture that it was in, included in that with some high powered officials from Jerusalem who had a lot of authority. And they said, you know, we can't deny what Jesus is doing as far as his healing. You know, they can't deny that people were healed. They can't deny that demons were dri driven out. But they said, here's what's causing that. Jesus is possessed by a demon. Jesus is possessed by a Beelzebub, which basically is Satan himself. Jesus is possessed by Satan. That's how he's doing this. We can't deny what he's doing, but he's possessed by, by Satan. Satan is doing this. I can imagine when they said that, Jesus almost probably sort of laughed. And he says, you guys, that doesn't make any sense. That is totally illogical. Satan can't drive out Satan. And then he told a couple parables and said, this is, this is just, it doesn't make any logical sense. And then he made a statement in verse 25 that actually is one of the key statements that we hear in political circles in our country's history. He says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Now, the reason why that's an important statement is because it's the statement that was given in 1858 by Abraham Lincoln, and he repeated it several times after in our country about the Civil War. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Now, I want to tell you, there's a temptation to preach a whole sermon on that over the fact of what's going on in our nation right now. A house divided against itself cannot stand. But Jesus told them, what you're saying doesn't make sense. And then he makes an interesting statement about the Holy Spirit. And here's what he says. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin ever since Jesus said that and it's listed in, in Matthew, Mark and Luke ever since Jesus said that a lot of Christians have been struggling did, did, did I commit the eternal sin? <sighs> did I commit the it used to be called the unpardonable sin? have I blasphemed the Holy Spirit? did I do something that's unforgivable? In my 40 years of ministry, I had people come to me at various times and ask that question. 
And I just thought through the, the past week as I was preparing this, I thought through some of the people who had come and, and asked me that question. I had a man who had been in the military who in the midst of battle said he made some decisions and that those deci- decisions might have contributed to some civilians being killed. And he said, can that sin be forgiven? And I told him, Absolutely. There was a young lady that came to me and said, you know, we've talked a lot in the church about abortion. Abortion is a terrible sin. And then she says, I had an abortion when I was younger. Was that the unforgivable sin? I said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. That's not an unforgivable sin. Jesus forgives you of that. I had a person who had gotten caught up in some borderline occult practices came and said, have I committed the unpardonable sin? And I said, no. You're forgiven of that. The fact that you feel conviction, you're forgiven of that. A person who had gone to a well-known faith healer's rally and came back and said he felt like it was fake, I said, well, what if it was real? Because I'm declaring that that wasn't real, might I have committed the unforgivable sin? I said, no, not at all. The blasphemy of a Holy Spirit, the eternal sin was not any of those things. Before I get into what it is, let me just reemphasize what it is not. Killing someone is not the unforgivable sin. Even though it's a bad thing, it's not the unforgivable sin. Moses killed when he was in Egypt. David, a man after God's own heart, killed the husband or had killed the husband of of Bathsheba, Uriah. So killing someone is not the unforgivable sin. Adultery, even the worst kind of sexual sin, is not unpardonable. David, I mentioned him earlier, he had adultery with Bathsheba. And God called him a man after his own heart. Doubt is not the unforgivable sin. Thomas, one of the twelve, doubted. Blasphemy, or taking the Lord's name in vain, is not the unpardonable sin. Paul said this, in 1 Timothy 1.13, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Let me point out to you, Satan, the literal name Satan means accuser. And one of the things that Satan likes to do is he likes to speak and to whisper in Christians' ears and say, "Ah, you're a sinner. God won't forgive that. God doesn't love you because of what you've done. Ah, That's a terrible thing. Ah, God can't forgive that. Ah, You've committed that sin before. God's not going to forgive that. And I want you to know that God forgives. God forgives whatever sin is present. In fact, in 1 John 1, 7, here's what John had to say. The blood of Jesus Christ purifies us from all sin. And when Jesus was on the cross, people that beat him, people that nailed, put nails in his hands and feet, people that that did terrible things and put him on a cross to die. And he says, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. So no matter what sin might have come into your life, no matter what sin has been present, God forgives. By the fact that you recognize there's sin in your life, you've not committed the unpardonable sin. So what is this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, the unpardonable sin? To explain that, I want to take us to the the best scripture that Jesus gives on the Holy Spirit. It's found in what's called the Upper Room Discourse, John chapter 14 to 17. And it's interesting, in John chapter 14 to 17, Jesus is in the Upper Room. It's the the night of the Last Supper, after the Last Supper. He's speaking with his disciples. He's going to go out into the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's actually going to be put to death the next morning. And so he's telling his disciples, oh boy, I got some important things to tell you before I go back up into heaven. I have important things to tell you before I die. And so he talks a lot about the Holy Spirit. And here's what he says about the Holy Spirit in John 16, 7 and 8. 
Very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt about sin and righteousness and judgment. Now, one of the things that Jesus says there, he says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to convict you of sin and righteousness and judgment. He's going to convict you of sin. Just to let you know, it's not Craig's job as your pastor to help you recognize the sin in your life. It's not your parents, although many times parents are pretty good at that. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict you. The Holy Spirit will let you know that there's sin in your life and that you need forgiveness. The Holy Spirit will guide that there's guilt and you need to be forgiven of whatever sin is present. There has to be a response. When you come to the end of your life and have never responded, that's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But when you come to the point in your life where you never recognize the sin or you never have a sense of guilt or recognize that you have to have repentance and seek forgiveness, that's the blasphemy. Now let me, let me share with you, a uh, way to explain it to you a little better is to, to share with you what Billy Graham has to say. You know, Billy Graham's written a book called The Holy Spirit, Activating God's Power in Your Life. And now Billy Graham, what he's written won't be, it won't be a theological book that'll be taught in seminaries, but it's a very practical guide as far as what the Holy Spirit does on a regular basis in your life. And in this book, the Holy Spirit activating God's power in your life, Billy Graham says there's three sins that you can act with the Spirit. And Scripture talks about them. The first sin is grieving the Spirit. I won't go into a lot of detail with this, but grieving the Spirit is when you don't live according to the fruit of the Spirit. It's listed in Galatians. If you don't live according to the fruit of the Spirit, you're grieving the Spirit. He says the second sin is to quench the Holy Spirit. And by the way, he says grieving the Holy Spirit, that's forgivable. It's absolutely forgivable. The second is to quench the Holy Spirit, and that's, forgive, that's forgivable. Quenching the Holy Spirit's whenever you don't seek God's presence in your life, when you don't read your Bible, when you don't pray, when you really stop thinking about God. But he said that's forgivable. But he said the third sin, the blaspheme the Holy Spirit, is not forgivable. And here's what he says. Let me quote to you what Billy Graham says about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. The unpardonable sin involves the total and irrevocable rejection of Jesus Christ. It is rejecting completely and finally the witness of the Holy Spirit, which declares that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, who alone can save us from our sins. No one has committed the unpardonable sin who continues to be under the disturbing, convicting, and drawing power of the Holy Spirit. You see, the un forgivable sin the eternal sin is when people have terminal unbelief the reason why God won't forgive is because the person never turns to ask and receive the forgiveness that God offers that Jesus came to give on the cross the unpardonable sin is where there's no repentance and no response to the Holy Spirit convicting of sin present in a person's life. Now let me give you an illustration of this. There's various times in my 40 years of ministry where I've gone into hospitals or I've gone into homes where people have asked me, would you go and talk to my neighbor or my father? They're going to go through surgery or they're going to have various things done and talk to them about Jesus Christ. Now, let me tell you, if, if that's the case in your life, the best thing you can do is actually talk to them yourself. Make sure that you talk to them about your faith in Christ and what that means. But sometimes there comes a point where you're saying, oh, you know, I've, I've done that and I really would like the pastor to come and 
and talk. And so I've gone into hospital rooms, I've gone into to people's homes, and I've talked to them about Jesus Christ. And there are times as I talk to them about Jesus Christ, I'll share the scripture, I'll share the fact, you know, there's a gentle confrontation that it's called. The gentle confrontation where we say, you know, there's sin that's present, and you don't have to name the sin, or you don't have to go into detail, but there's sin that's present in your life, and that sin has to be forgiven. And that's why Jesus came. He died on the cross for you to recognize that sin and to ask for forgiveness and to accept it. And there are times whenever I've shared that with people and they've responded and they've said, yes, I want that forgiveness. I want to feel whole. I want to feel in the presence of God. I want to be able to feel peace in my life because that sin's been taken away. And you can pray with them. And to be honest, I've seen responses that I believe that salvation took place. Now, God's the one that respond, you know, the one that's the judge and declares that, but where I think that salvation has taken place. There are times where I've shared that with people, and they've said, Well, you know, I'm I'm not I'm not ready. Or, you know, I I, I just I just can't I just can't accept that right now. And when that's the case, here's what I say. I pray to God and I say, God, help their family to be able to share with them or somebody else. Or help them to think about the scriptures they've heard or a prayer that their grandmother's given them way back when. But help them to remember that. Come into their life and help them recognize they need forgiven. And then there are other times that I share with people and there's just a blank stare. It doesn't register at all because they have rejected God so much that he's just not present. And when that happens and a person dies and has never responded, that's the eternal sin. That's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's the unforgivable sin. By the fact that you're here, by the fact that you recognize God's presence, by the fact that you realize there's conviction of sin in your life, you've not committed that sin. Now, my prayer is that you've responded to that call that Jesus Christ has made in your life, that you recognize that he died on the cross to forgive whatever happened in your life, whatever, no matter how great or how small. God forgives as long as we accept it, we repent and have faith. If you've never repented or had faith this morning, you need to do that. Talk to Pastor Craig when the service is over. Come up and talk to me. We can take you through that process of what that means. The only way that the unforgivable sin comes is if you never respond before the end comes. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this passage of Scripture. Thank you for calling those 12 strange people as disciples. All of us can identify in some way, shape, or form with them. But you brought them together to make a difference and help us as a church, help us as Christians to do that. We especially think about that in our society today and what's going on. Help us to love, respect, and forgive just as the disciples came to learn and to do. And then, Father God, help us. Help us to recognize the need for forgiveness for the conviction that comes for the sin that is already forgiven because of what Jesus has done as long as we respond. Help us to respond. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen.